Hey guys, so in today's video, I wanted to go through my top 10 Survivor players of the new era, which at the time of recording spans from Survivor 41 to Survivor 44, and I think this could be an interesting list. I feel like each of these four seasons has their fair share of interesting players, which in turn leads to this being a pretty interesting list. Although, before we get started, I do have a decent amount of honorable mentions, so let's get right into those. So first up from Survivor 41, I did consider Evie, and I think Evie is all around a pretty solid player. I feel like they're pretty good physically, as we saw them win a decent amount of challenges. And plus, they were the leader of the Yasa tribe, given their strong relationships with Tiffany, Liana, and Xander. That allowed them to be in a very solid position there. However, the problem is that when that group became a minority at the merge, they were seen as the leader of that group and the biggest target there. And plus, I don't think they played that split trial particularly well, where I feel like they had a number of outs, namely with Xander having both an idol and an extra vote, and the fact that they weren't able to get him to play either of those is a pretty big knock at the end of the day. However, I still think Evie is a pretty consistent player. I feel like they're probably going to get to the merge more often than not, and I feel like with their issue of threat management, I feel like they could definitely rectify that on the return. But I feel like for this list, I feel like it wasn't quite enough to crack into it. Next up, I did consider Deshaun, also from 41, and I think Deshaun is another pretty solid player for the most part. Kind of similar to Heavy, they pretty much dominated their pre-merge tribe, and I feel like they played a solid early merge. However, I feel like their game completely crumbles at the Sham boot, where I feel like by allowing Shan to go, that essentially hands a lot of the power to the Erica and Heather side, and with Ricard being a leader in that, that causes Deshaun to fall to the numbers moving forward, and I feel like by the end, like, they don't handle certain people the best. I feel like him getting to fights with Shan is a big reason he loses her jury vote, and plus his truth bomb at the Final Six tribe wasn't great either. I feel like Deshaun definitely has a lot of pieces of being a good player. However, I feel like there were enough issues to leave them off the list. Next up from 42, I did consider Drea, and I think Drea is sort of similar to Shan in the sense of her being a leader for her initial tribe. I feel like she plays the pre-merge pretty well for the most part, and plus with the merge, she is part of that threats alliance that allows her to stay in the numbers there. However, I feel like there's something missing with Drea. I feel like she's kind of a worse version of Shan. I feel like they have a lot of the similar issues. However, I feel like Drea definitely made some blunders there, namely with her telling Ulmer about her knowledge is power that allows him to completely outplay her during her boot round. And plus, I think her threat management wasn't the best. So at the end of the day, I feel like Drea didn't quite crack the list, although she was a bit closer to making the list than the people we already talked about. I also considered Lindsay from 42, and I think Lindsay is another pretty good player. I feel like she was working alongside Omar for a lot of the game in controlling the Taku 4, and plus she had a decent amount of win equity by the end, where by the final 5, she was probably the biggest jury threat left on the board, which obviously explains why she's targeted there, but I feel like had she won that last challenge, which she was relatively close to, I feel like she would have been in a decent spot to win that game. However, the main reason I don't have her on the list is I feel like strategically she can get a bit too tunnel visioned, particularly with her rivalry with Jonathan, where she completely allows that relationship to crumble. And I feel like it got a lot of her decision making, like her deciding to go into do or die at the final seven. When her and Jonathan were the only ones could be in that challenge is pretty dumb there. You also have her not using her idol on Omer at the final six. I think that's also a bit of an oversight. So I feel like those flaws were enough to leave her off the list. However, I still feel like Lindsay's a relatively good player. Also from 42, I did consider Mike, and I think Mike's another pretty solid player, where despite him being the oldest player on the cast, he was able to build very solid relationships, and he was able to get through a lot of the game because of that. And I think he's also adaptable to a point where we saw him early on be willing to work with Hai and Lydia, even though they had just taken out Jenny, one of his closest allies. But then later on, he completely writes off Chanel because she wrote his name down. And I feel like that sort of guides a lot of Mike's gameplay during the post-merge, where we see him coming up with these rationalizations for voting out people that he was previously working with. And I think Mike also struggles a lot with managing his perception in the eyes of the players in the game as well as the jury where we obviously see him burning these relationships with Chanel and Roxway due to him like playing a bit too emotionally. We also see him not go along with the Omer blind set, the Final Six that allows Marianne to take all the credit for that move. He also plays his idol for Marianne at the Final Five which inherently isn't the worst move but it does lead to Marianne completely like outshining him at Final Tribal by showing that she still had her own idol despite the fact that he played one on her and obviously his final Final Tribal is pretty bad, where he still had a shot of winning the game, where a decent amount of the jury was willing to vote for him. However, with him bombing Final Tribal, and also Marion having a solid Final Tribal, I feel like that leads to him losing the game. So, 
I feel like those are issues that are holding me back from putting Mike on the list, but I still find this game somewhat impressive. And I did also consider Marianne the winner of 42, who again, I think is a good player. However, I feel like she can be a bit high variance where we even saw in her original season that she was not in the core majority on Taku originally. And while she does survive that first tribal, I feel like she would have been in a lot of danger if they ever went back to tribal. Post-merge, I feel like she's not really in the driver's seat for a lot of it. I feel like she's probably the least integral member of the Taku 4 for a lot of that post-merge. And while I think her endgame is pretty impressive, like the fact that she takes all the credit for the Omer blind side, the fact that Mike plays an idol for her, the fact that she has a relationship with Romeo that allows him to take her to the final three and obviously her solid final tribal performance she wasn't even guaranteed to win the game coming to final tribal and she needed a solid final tribal to win the game so i feel like marianne while definitely a good player is not the most consistent in the world and i feel like there are definitely scenarios where she could be an early boot so i think those were enough to leave her off the list Next up from 43, I did consider Noelle, which did surprise me to a degree where even though her game was pretty rocky, I think she's a pretty well-rounded player where I feel like in most scenarios, she makes it relatively far. I feel like she's pretty good at all three aspects of the game, social, strategic, and particularly physically. And I feel like she's a type of player that can win if she gets to the end on most seasons. However, I feel like on her individual season, we didn't really see as much of that where she was on the bottom for a lot of it. However, I feel like if Noelle were to come back, I wouldn't be surprised if she did very well there, so I did consider her at least. Also from 43, I did consider Sammy, and I think Sammy's a player with a lot of potential, where despite him being very young, we saw him like build these very strong relationships during the game, where on the original Baka, he was able to build a relationship with Ellie, along with Owen, that allowed him to be in a good position there. Post-merge, he's able to build a very strong relationship with the Cody and Jesse side, but also has a very solid relationship with Carla, and that allows him to be included on votes that he probably shouldn't have, namely the Dwight vote. I feel like he's able to ride the middle for a lot of that post-merge, and he's even able to pull off the Jane's move, where he's able to tell Carla about the Jane's move and for her to go along with it, which I find pretty impressive there. Although at the same time, it sort of exposes his middle position, where from that point on, he's pretty much at the bottom and taken out at the final seven. However, I think Sammy showed a lot of skill during that season, and despite his age, I feel like if he came back a couple years later, maybe be a little bit older, I think he could be a very dangerous player on the return. So all in all, I think Sammy's a pretty solid player. Also from 43, I did consider Carla, and I think Carla's also in this Drea and Shan mold of her being this very well positioned player in the pre-merge. I feel like she's pretty good socially for the most part, where she was able to be good with both the James, Cassidy, and Lindsay side, as well as the Geo and Ryan side. However, my biggest problem with Carla is her strategic ability, where I feel like she makes a number of very questionable decisions during the season, like her taking out Geo over Ryan before the merge. I think that's pretty bad. You also have her taking out James at the split tribal when she very easily could have saved him, really puts her in a bad position moving forward. And you also have her getting in this rivalry with Cassidy towards the end game that makes her a target there. And I I feel like by the end she gets completely outplayed by the Cody and Jesse side to where she loses a lot of her core allies in the merge that results her in being this target at the end game. So I feel like for those reasons I can't include Carla despite her good position during a lot of the early game. And I also consider Gabler who I think gets a bit too much hate from the online community. However I think Gabler is someone that is pretty good socially. He's able to build very solid relationships and I think he was also very active in positioning himself in the post merge where he saw him getting into two final three deals, one with Cody and Jesse, and then later on with Owen and Cassidy, which he was able to ride out and get into. And plus, he was very good at managing his perception, where even though he knew that he would beat Cassidy and Owen at the end, that he was able to come off in a way to where neither of them suspected that they could lose to him at the end, which is pretty good there. However, my biggest issue with Gabler is that's probably the only final three scenarios that he wins in. Now, I do give him credit for recognizing that that's the scenario that he wins in. And even in that scenario, when we hear the jury talk about why they voted for him, they cite these very marginal things, such as him being behind the Ellie move, when I don't even think that's the case. I think Ellie more so did that to herself. And then beating Jesse and Fire, which I feel like on most seasons would be a pretty minor thing, but given this final three, it ended up being the decision maker. But I feel like on most seasons, Gabler's the type of person that would struggle to win a jury vote. Now again, I don't think he's the worst player in the world, but I feel like for this top 10 list, it wasn't quite enough to make the cut for me. And then the final honorable mention here is Carolyn from 44. And I think Carolyn's also a pretty good player for the most part. 
and it's sort of similar to Gabler in that she relies a lot on being underestimated and managing her perception in order to build inroads with people. However, I think the big difference between her and Gabler is that she was unable to break out of that perception where people continued to not take her that seriously even deep into the game, which led to her not being well respected by the jury. And plus, she didn't really have the killer instinct to take out Jan Jam and Carson, where she wanted to go to the end with Carson and Jan Jam. And I feel like she loses in that scenario as she clearly loses to Jan Jan by the end and probably loses to Carson as well. I think Carolyn lacks a killer instinct and a desire to play the game as cutthroat compared to Gabler, which leads to her being less successful in the game. But I still feel like Carolyn is a competent strategic thinker, but not always willing to act upon those strategic thoughts. So I feel like Carolyn didn't quite make the cut for me. So those are all the honorable mentions that I had. But with all that out of the way, we have 10 players to rank, and let's not waste any more time, let's get right into the video. So starting off at number 10, we have a player that my view of them has gone up over time, where I remember at the time I was pretty low on their game, but I feel like as we have learned more information and I've had more time to reflect, I did decide to bump this person up, but here we have Erica, the winner of 41, and I think at the time, I was very much harping on the fact that she got lucky during the game, like the fact that Nasir went all out during that challenge that Deshaun and Danny tried to throw. The fact that she got the hourglass twist in a spot where it seemed like she was going to be the consensus target. However, with the information that we have learned since the season, it turns out she wasn't really in as much danger as it seemed, where while there was a point where Deshaun would have targeted Erica for not going along with the Cindy plan, it now appears that he actually would have stuck by the Erica, Heather, and Nasir side to take out Cindy. So even then, I don't think Erica was in the most danger. And plus, even without Deshaun, she still had half the tribe on her side side with her having a very close bond with Heather and Nasir being very anti Sydney. So I think even that spot of the game isn't as big of a knock. And while she still gets lucky during the hourglass, I feel like from that point on, she is in the majority for most of the game, where the core power structure was Luvu plus Shannon Ricard. And plus her and Heather were a factor in flipping the game against Shannon at the final eight. Where while I would give Ricard more the credit for flipping the game against Shan, I feel like Erica and Heather benefit the most from it, where by doing so, it shifts the target to the Danny and the Sean side, while Ricard becomes the figurehead moving forward. I think Erica is very good at navigating this endgame, and by the final four, she's pretty much guaranteed to get to the end, and she beats everyone left there, where we obviously see Xander decide to not put her into fire, as thinking that putting her in would take a move off her resume, when in reality, she was probably winning anyway. So I think Erica is all around a pretty solid player, and I think I'm a bit higher on her winning game than I was initially. Now, granted, compared to the rest of the field, I feel like there are less like upsides that I can get to Erica, where I still think Think there's a world where she could be targeted early as we saw with the likes of Helen early on in 44. I think there are definitely scenarios where her gameplay style could result in her being targeted. However, I still think Erica is a pretty competent player all things considered, which is a big reason she is here at number 10. Now I'm moving on to number 9 and I did struggle with these next couple players as I feel like they're all pretty solid players but all have pretty notable issues. However, number 9, I did decide to go with Cody from 43. And I think the thing about Cody is he is a very solid player. He's very good socially. He's able to build these very strong relationships. And he is obviously one of the bigger players on the season where he was working alongside Jesse for a lot of the game. The two of them were dominating the game together. However, I feel like Jesse was more so the strategic mastermind behind it, while Cody was more of the second in command. However, Cody was perceived as being the bigger threat between the two of them, where I feel like had they gotten to the and together, Cody probably wins. Now, we don't have 100% confirmation of this. However, the fact that Jesse saw Cody as the bigger threat does lend some credence to this idea that Jesse was probably the biggest stray threat by the end game even though Jesse was the one leading the charge. However, that leads into Jesse deciding to take the shot against Cody at the final six, which is a bit of an issue in terms of threat management, but not to the same degree as other players we talked about in the honorable mentions section. However, the big reason that I have Cody this low on the list is his biggest flaw, which is his loyalty. He was too blindly loyal to Jesse, where during the Dwight round, we see him hand off his idol to Jesse to avoid a knowledge's power play, 
but then he just allows Jesse to hold on to it during most of the post-merge. Like, he just trusts Jesse so much that he allows him to keep it, which is pretty insane there on its own. And yes, while he does ask for it back, it's mainly to show that he does in fact have an idol to the likes of Carla. And then he ultimately gives it back to Jesse without Jesse even asking. So I feel like that just shows that he was just too blindly loyal to Jesse. And when he's eventually blindsided by Jesse that very same round, he's just completely shocked at this prospect. So I think the fact that he was so blindly loyal is a pretty big knock against this game. However, I also think it's an issue that he could fix if he were to come back. As out Outside of that, he is a very solid player, he is very good socially, he is very good at garnering respect, and I feel like if he were to come back and fix that issue, he could definitely be a very dangerous player. And also I think he's a player that could be underestimated to a degree, where he comes off as a bit kooky to a degree. So I think it's for all those reasons that I actually have a lot of faith in Cody, both on any given season, and especially if he were to come back on a future season. But I feel like that flaw was enough to keep him here at number 9. Now I'm moving on to number 8, and I realize this person might be a bit of a stretch considering how their run went. However, I feel like the limited evidence that we saw from them was enough to put him on. But number eight, the only pre-merge boot that we have that made this list, we do have Matthew from 44. And it's tough because obviously we only saw Matthew play the pre-merge game. He actually only went to one tribal the entire season. And even then, he didn't even cast a vote given his shot in the dark play. And obviously, we have other players that were in the honorable mention section that were in a similar position where they dominated the pre-merge. And then obviously, their post-merge wasn't as spectacular. But I think what separates Matthew from other players that we saw dominate their pre-merge tribes is his innovation, where he used a number of very creative strategies that highlight his willingness to play outside the box where we saw him at the first tribal using his shot in the dark in order to ride the middle and even then he's the one that tells Brandon about Maddie's plan to blindside him which causes Brandon to flush the idol and take out Maddie, someone that wasn't quite as close to him. But then after that, we see Matthew find the real idol, and then he plants a fake idol in order for Jamie to find, which then he uses to build a game relationship with her, which is a very creative use of that strategy there. And he was really well set up moving forward, where had he not quit the game, he would have come into the merge in a pretty solid position where he could have like used these numbers like Carson and Jamie in order to remain in power during a lot of it. Now, as I talked about in my 44 player ranking I don't know if he gets to the very end where I feel like he still probably would have been targeted at some point due to him being this big threat but the way in which he was willing to use these new strategies shows a creative strategic thinking that we haven't really seen from any of these other new era players and the fact that none of it seems to ever blow up in his face is such a major pro for me that I did decide to put him on the list even though he is only a pre-merge boot. Now at the end of the day the fact that we don't know how he would have done in the post-merge was enough to ensure that he couldn't be any higher on this list. I feel like there were enough pros for me to where I did decide to put Matthew here at number 8. Now I'm moving on to number 7 and I really struggled with this next one as this person did play a pretty impressive game all things considered. However, I think this person also has some pretty big holes in their game that makes me question how well they would do on any given season. But at number 7, we do have Shan. And I think Shan obviously played an incredible pre-merge where we saw her go to tribal after tribal on Ua and her being so well positioned on that group to where every single person on that tribe thought that she was their ride or die. And I think that's very impressive, the fact that she was able to build all of those bonds and survive all those rounds without ever being in danger is really impressive in my eyes. You also have her going on the journey right before the merge and building such a strong bond with Liana to where she's willing to flip from the Yasa group in order to work with Shan moving forward, which is pretty good there. And at the merge, we even see her building the Black Alliance, which allows her to be in the core of the majority moving forward and weaken the Yasas by, again, pulling over Liana. So I think the first half of her game is extremely impressive and a big reason that I have her on the list over the legs of Drea or Carla, where we simply have more evidence of her strong position of her surviving all those tribals and putting herself in a good position however my biggest issue with Shan is her strategic thinking where despite her putting herself in a good position 
I don't think she always makes the correct decision with that power, where we see her, even on Ua, decide to vote out Brad first over JD, which I think is a suboptimal move. But I think the bigger indictment is during the split tribal, where she decides to take out Nasir with an idol in his pocket, which I think is such a big mistake on her end, as Nasir was pretty loyal to her and would have been a number for her in the future. And plus, it gives Ricard the ammunition he needs to pull the trigger and blindside her at the very next round with an idol in her pocket, which I think is also a little bit of a knock there. I think Shane is a player that's very good at getting herself in a good position through her social game, but I feel like her strategic game isn't good enough to ensure that she's making the correct decisions with her social game that can allow her to become a big target and to take out people that would be willing to work with her in the future, and I feel like on a player ranking that's a big issue for me. But I still feel like the fact that we saw her survive all those tribals, the fact that we saw her get into that good position to begin with, is enough to have her this high on the list, but I feel like the top 6 players are better, which is why she is here at number 7. Now I'm moving on to number 6, and we actually have a player that was closely aligned with Shan, but here we have Ricard, and it was a debate between Ricard and Shan. However, I did decide to give Ricard the edge, as I feel like I have more faith in Ricard strategically to make the optimal move, and I will say that Shan is probably probably better socially than Ricard, where I feel like Shan was more well positioned on Owa compared to Ricard. She was literally the swing vote during that last tribal before the merge, and I feel like Shan did more to branch out in terms of building the Black Alliance at the merge, and I think there are definitely scenarios where Ricard may be received a bit coldly. I feel like he may not always build the best bonds, but he's not bad socially either. He still had decent relationships on that tribe, and the fact that he was able to have such a good relationship with Shan to where she is essentially chooses Ricard over Genie, despite him being a bigger strategic threat, I think says a lot about his ability to build some relationships. But the main reason I have Ricard above Shan is that I have a lot more faith in Ricard strategically compared to Shan, where I feel like Shan has these instances of making suboptimal moves, whereas I feel like Ricard could think about the game a bit more cerebrally, and I feel like he's more willing to take the shot compared to Shan, where obviously we see him taking the shot against Shan at the final aid. Mind you, I thought it was a bit too early as it obviously makes him a bigger target moving forward, but even then he's still able to get through a couple of rounds all right, and he's still able to have some allies in Xander, Erica, and Heather that allows him to get all the way to the final five, where from that point on he does it to win out. However, he does win the game if he gets to the end, so I think that's a big factor there. I think if we really look at it, Shane and Ricard are relatively close, but I feel like I have more faith in Ricard strategically, which was enough to give him the edge over Shan, which is a big reason that he's here at number six. Now moving on to number five, and we actually have the highest ranked player from Survivor 41, but here we have Danny. And I always saw Danny as a pretty solid player, definitely one of the more well-rounded players, good socially, good strategically, good physically. And plus he had a decent amount of win equity where had he gotten to the end, he probably wins. And despite him being one of the more outwardly physical guys, he wasn't seen as much of a physical threat for most of that post-merge, where a big reason he's eventually targeted at the final six is due to him being a social threat more so than a physical threat. However, I will also say that his game probably isn't as strong as some of the players we already talked about, where while he was well positioned on the original Lubu tribe, supposedly had they gone the tribal, he would have been on the outside of that vote as he would have sided with Sydney, who probably loses out on that vote. So I don't think that's particularly great. And also you can make the claim that part of the reason he wasn't seen as big of a physical threat is due to the hourglass twist, which really shook up his confidence apparently to where he didn't try as much in physical challenges on the chance that it gets potentially taken away from him in the future. So I think that's a bit of a wonky circumstance, but I still see Danny as a pretty solid player. And I think someone that we would do pretty well on pretty much any season that he's put on. But I feel like the top four players have more pros going for them and more highlights to their game, which is a big reason that Danny is here number five. Now I'm moving on to number four and I did kind of struggle with this player as well as I feel like they have one sticking point that makes me put them lower. However, I think this player also showed a lot of skill across their season and I think they would have a lot of potential coming into any given season. But at number four, I did decide to go with Jam Jam, the winner of Survivor 44. And I think Jam Jam is a very solid player. I feel like he would do well on almost any season that he's put on. He's pretty great socially to where he's able to build bonds with a wide range of players. Now, I will also say that he does have a tendency to get into arguments, so take that as you will. But I feel like more times than not, he's able to build good bonds with people and to get people to want to take his side. And plus, I think compared to other players, we've seen him go through more 
adversity than a lot of those other players, where we saw him being in bad positions at certain points, such as right after the swap, where he's obviously in a bad position there, loses Sarah, but then he's able to turn it around to where he's able to bomb with Josh and make himself the swing vote if they go at the tribal, but still have Carolyn in his good graces. So he's able to turn that around. And he also had the split tribal where he was put in a very bad position, but is able to survive that as the Ratus basically choose him over Matt. Now, granted, I think the Ratus recognize that Matt was a juicier target at that point, given the Sokas were more of a force at that point compared to the Tikas, but still you do have to give Janjin some credit for surviving that round. And from that point on, he and Carson are able to dominate the game together where they're able to ride the middle for a lot of it. All the while, Jan Jam is able to be in a better position at the end game compared to Carson, where at the final four, he's almost guaranteed to get to the end, given that more people want to take him to the end. And plus, he's pretty good in fire to where even if he had gone to fire, he had a very good shot of winning that challenge. And plus, he was pretty well respected by the jury to where he wins against pretty much everyone except Carson, which admittedly ties into one of his faults, where he did want to take Carson to the end as he wanted it all take a final three, where I do think he probably loses that, especially now knowing what we know from the exit interviews. And plus, while I think Carson and Jan Jan were working together for a lot of the game, I do think Carson was a bit more in the driver's seat compared to Jan Jam, which is why I do give Carson a bit more credit for a lot of the moves they were making, even though I still think Jan Jam had a pretty solid hand in allowing those plans to go through. So I still think Jan Jam is a very strong player and one of the better players from the new era, and easily the most satisfying winner of the new era. But I feel like compared to the top three, I feel like Jan Jam has a bit more holes in his game potential particularly strategically, and even socially, I don't think he's perfect. So I think for it's for all those reasons that I do have to leave Jan Jim here at number four. Now I'm moving on to number three, and I feel like this top three should be pretty obvious, as I feel like each of these three players were the main strategic forces on their respective seasons, and it's just a matter of ordering them. But number three, we actually have the only person on this list from Survivor 42, but here we have Omer. And again, I think Omer is a very well-rounded player. He's someone that I think would do well on pretty much any season that he's put on, where we saw him dominate the Taku tribe, being in a very solid position there, building the Taku 4 alliance. At the merge, he's able to pull in all these big threats, such as High, Mike, and Drea, in order to steamroll a lot of the post-merge. He is the main person that goes out of his way to save Jonathan during that first tribal and put the votes onto Lydia at that first tribal. And moving forward, he's in a very solid position where he's able to take out a lot of the smaller players, players that don't really aid in his game. But then at the final eight, we see him start to flip the game against those big threats in order to take the Taku 4 deeper into the game, with him splitting the votes to take out high at the final eight. And after Drea tells him about her knowledge as power at the final seven in order to steal Mike's idol, he uses that information to flip the votes against Drea. But I think by doing that, that causes him to be the biggest threat left on the board, and that really opens it up for Marianne to blindside him at the final six. And I do have to fault him for failing to convince Lindsay to use her idol to save him, even though it was the last round in which she could use it, and she had won immunity that round. So I do fault him a bit for that, but really, I think everything else about this game is pretty solid solid, I think I would have a lot of faith in him coming into any given season. Now obviously there's a lot of talk about his jury chances on that season, where obviously we know from after the season that Drea turned the jury against him, which made it so that it would have been very hard for him to win the game had he gone to the end. However, I don't really fault that as much on a player ranking for him, as I feel like that was a very unique circumstance where Drea was obviously mad at him for supposedly going after the players of color, and I feel like that's just not going to be a major factor on any given season. I do think most times, I think Omer is able to build good relationships while at the same time garnering respect along the way, but I still think Omer is a very solid player and definitely one of the better ones from the new era. However, I think the top two players clearly have a step over him, which is why I do have him here at number three. Now I'm moving on to number two, and this was tough, as I feel like these two players played very similar games, and they both demonstrated a lot of potential across their seasons. And initially, I thought this player was going to be number one coming into it. However, after thinking about some more, I did decide to put Jesse here at number two. And I decided to go with this placement for a couple of reasons. 
One is his physical ability, where I feel like one of Jesse's biggest issues as a player is that he can't win a challenge to save his life. And while normally I wouldn't factor that in as much, I feel like it played a major factor in the end game, where coming to the final four, he had two chances to save himself, and we see him completely fail at both challenges, where in the final four immunity challenge, he was barely in it. And then during the fire making challenge, he loses to Gabler in swift fashion. So I feel like on any given season, if he's a big threat, I don't know how he's going to be able to get to the end given his inability to win challenges. So I think that's a factor. And I think the other factor is during a lot of the season, even though he was playing by far the best game, it didn't seem like he was the biggest jury threat on the board, where even though Jesse was doing more of the legwork to allow him and Cody to dominate the game in the post merge, it seems like had they gone to the end together that Cody would have gotten more of the credit and beaten Jesse in a jury vote, which obviously explains why Jesse makes the move to blindside Cody at the final six, which in turn is a big reason that he becomes the big threat that he does at the end game. So I think those are all things that make me hesitate with putting Jesse at number one, as I feel like it's not always going to be a guarantee that he gets the credit he deserves at the end, and if he does become a big threat, I don't know how he's going to be able to scrape his way out of that situation outside challenge wins or idols, which I don't think are things that he can really rely upon. But if we are taking that out, Jesse is a great player. He played an incredible game on 43, where he is able to essentially be in a dominant position on his initial tribe. At the merge, he and Cody are able to essentially dominate the game, where even though the Coco seem pretty poised to take control from that point on, we see Cody and Jesse essentially take the power away from the Cocos in order to dictate how a lot of the game plays out. I think Jesse is a very strong social player where we see him be able to bond with a wide group of people and build such a good bond with Cody to where Cody gives him his idol during the Dwight round and Cody just allows Jesse to hang on to it round after round and even at the point where he gives it back to Cody to show it off, Cody then gives it back to Jesse which I think is pretty insane there. So I think Jesse is a very good social player able to build good bonds and I think strategically he's very sound one of the better strategic players from the new era and i think his recognizing the need to take out cody at the final six is a big factor in him making the biggest move of the season and ensures that he would win the game if he gets to the end however that obviously leads to him being a big threat but i still think jesse is one of the better players from the new era however i think the person number one is a slightly better version of him which is why he is here at number two and now at number one, the best player of the new era so far is Carson from 44. And again, it was a very close debate between Carson and Jesse. However, I think there are a couple things that edge Carson out. One is I think Carson's better at challenges than Jesse where we obviously saw Carson win several challenges over the course of the season, some of which stemming due to his uh, studying of the puzzles, but still, the fact that he's able to win challenges gives me a bit more faith that Carson can squeak his way out of situations, although even then, he doesn't do so by the end. I think another factor is that we know that Carson was more likely to win a jury vote at the end compared to Jesse, where Jesse had to cut Cody in order to become the biggest jury threat on the board, Whereas I feel like Carson was the biggest jury threat from earlier on, and we even see him try to get an all Tika final three, where it does seem like he wins that. So I think the fact that Carson was able to convey his game in a way that causes him to get more respect from the jury is a big factor in him at being above Jesse. And I think another factor is that we see Carson in more situations in his game compared to Jesse, where obviously on 44, we do see a tried swap. We do see Carson going over to the Ratus and being the only member from that tribe on there however instead we see him essentially become a swing vote where he's able to build great bonds with the likes of lauren matthew and kane to where he would have been a pretty pivotal vote on that tribe if they went to tribal so i think through that we see more evidence of carson's game playing out and I think that leads right into his overall game, where I feel like Carson and Jesse are probably around the same level in terms of their social and strategic games, where it actually does surprise me, considering that Carson was so young, and that was a big worry that I had for him coming into the season. And there are comparisons to be made with Sammy, who I said 
that if Sammy were to wait a couple of years before playing, that I feel like he could do pretty well. Carson comes in at 20 years old and essentially is able to build bonds with so many of these different personalities to where they are able to respect his game. And the fact that he is able to play such a dominant game where he and Jan Jam and Carolyn are able to ride the middle for pretty much the entire post merge without ever being targeted is pretty insane there. And really, he only becomes targeted towards the very end of his game, where that does kind of bite him to a degree but considering his challenge ability that I talked about earlier, I felt like Carson had a bit of a better shot of getting to the very end compared to Jesse at that point. However, obviously he doesn't quite go through, but I still feel like Carson is very similar to Jesse in a lot of ways. Both of them are very strong socially and strategically, but I feel like it's those minor things that give Carson the edge over Jesse, and it's really for all those things that make me think that Carson is the best player of the new era so far. And there we go, that will do it for this week's video. If you like this content, be sure to like and subscribe, really helps out with the channel. Now I'll be back again next week with another Survivor video, so stay tuned for that. And if you haven't already, be sure to join my Discord server, which you can join by clicking the link in the description. There's a lot of stuff coming your way, but for now, that's the video. See ya.